I didn't even have time to like talk to her or do anything because I was just like, oh my gosh, this was the most special and meaningful moment that has happened outside with Ford ever. Hey, welcome to The Rare Life. I'm your host, Madeline Cheney. Today we have Effie Parks from the previous episode to give us her special topic episode all about friendship and inclusion for our children and for us. This was a super fun conversation because it began with the intention to have it be all about friendship and inclusion for our children, but then it took a life of its own, which is so fun when that happens. And the last half became inclusion and friendship for us. In this episode, Effie shares some heartwarming stories about her four-year-old Ford and how something as small and simple as putting LED lights around his wheelchair wheels has made all the difference in feeling included in their community. We also chat about the dialogue between parents and children in typical families and decreasing the stigma and fear around people with disabilities. We also talk about how our relationships and friendships have evolved and shifted as a result of our children and ways that we found closeness despite the lack of total understanding of what our lives are like. This conversation was seriously fun and I hope you enjoy it as much as we did. Let's jump in. Hi Effie, welcome back. Hey Madeline, I'm so excited to talk to you again. Thanks for inviting me. Yes. So today we get to chat about uh, our children in regards to their friendships with other people. And I know this is a topic that is near and dear to your heart. And I would love to start out with you just kind of telling us about Ford's current situation with friends. What is it like? So Ford's main, main friendship right now is obviously me, his best friend, (laughs) um, So he actually is in developmental preschool four days a week for about an hour and a half. Um, He's been the only kid doing it during COVID times until just a couple weeks ago, a couple of the kids came back and Ford came home just a different kid when they were all back. And he saw a couple of his buddies from last year. Ford feeds off of social situations it's he's a he's an extrovert for sure (laughs) and being around people makes him so happy so I'm really Mm -hmm. excited that school has started something really Mm -hmm. special if you have time for a story oh of course I love stories it's a story so um you know I think like most parents who have a kid like Ford we are always worried about whether or not our kids are going to have real friends or meaningful relationships Mm -hmm. and I think about that a lot, especially when I'm waiting for the school bus and I see kids walking up and down and, you know, I kind of get a little sad sometimes. And I wonder like if Ford's ever going to have friends at the bus and Mm. all of those things happen, but we were at our park a couple weeks ago, maybe a couple months ago at this time, who knows what day it is. And we were on a family walk on a Sunday. So my husband and my little girl and Ford and I were Mm walking around the loop Ford was in his wheelie and it was packed it was like a rare beautiful sunshiny day in Seattle and people everywhere and you know when we're out with Ford we get a lot of stares right he's a little kid he's wearing glasses he's in a wheelchair he's not responding when people are you know saying excuse me or something like that Mm -hmm. so we don't really get a lot of interaction with people and on this day we were walking and I saw this woman like 15 feet ahead of me and I saw her stop and she kind of like bent her legs and her she put her arms out <laughs> and she was like basically like oh my god and I was kind of like what is happening <sighs> and she grabbed her three sons they were like these really handsome like middle school maybe young high school boys she was like come on come on and she ran up to Ford And she was like, hi, buddy. I love your wheelchair. How are you? These are my sons, so-and-so and so-and-so. And And they were like, hi. (laughs) And she was like, do you like dogs? 
and he's not talking and she brought her dog over and she was like go ahead and pet him go ahead and Ford's being timid oh and she's gosh. like yeah it's okay don't worry about it you can pat him he he loves kids and she's having a conversation oh with gosh. Ford she hasn't even seen us as a family standing mm. behind and I am just watching this moment like in disbelief I look at these three boys who are of the age where it is cool to not be with your mom and to not do (laughs) stuff like this. And they were smiling. And I mean, I could tell through their masks, their eyes were all smiling. (laughs) And they were talking to Ford too. And I was just like, what is happening? Nobody has ever done this before. Nobody's ever came up and just made Ford feel like a regular kid at the park. Like, Hey, I like your wheels. And it just, it touched me so much. And I didn't even have time to like talk to her or do anything because I was just like, Oh my gosh, this was the most special and meaningful moment that has happened outside with Ford ever. Mm. And later that night I wrote a post on next door. I don't know if you know about that app. It's usually where people complain about dog poop and uh-huh. cars parked in the wrong place. Uh-huh. And I made a post about that, that situation that happened and that woman that I never got her name and you would not even believe what happened. I'm, I got like over 150 messages from people and people wow. saying, I can't wait to see Ford out the park. We'll say hi to him. Oh my gosh. Uh, you know, like we want to be friends. Uh, and then we got so many invites for play dates and we've been hanging out with these two kiddos at the park ever since. Wow. And <laughs> they just ride their scooters and they go next to Ford and they aren't awkward and they aren't weird. They're just kids and they're being exposed to Ford without there being any barrier about why maybe they should act weird or whatever they just hang out and these kids like tell their dad they want to see him and so they text me and I bring Ford to the park and I can't even (laughs) believe it's happening and it was all from this woman being so nice to us at the park and the post I made saying thank you to her and I wish this happened more often to like people flooding my inbox saying oh my gosh, sometimes we just don't know what to do. Now I'm going to say, hi, I can't wait to meet Ford. It was a long story, but it, it really changed everything with feeling like I belonged in my community and feeling like Ford is going to have friends and I need to just like chill out (laughs) and you know what I think friends are or should be, or looks like it's just, it's going to be however it is with Ford. And Mm. Ford doesn't care. He just wants a high five and he wants to be there. Like <laughs> yeah. it was, it was really special. And it really made me think a lot about how people just don't know what to do and what to say. Yeah. yeah. And how important it is to kind of, obviously we always open that door, right? Like we're the parents mm-hmm. who are like, hi, hi, mm-hmm. <laughs> we're saying hi all the time because we want to invite people in. Uh-huh. Yeah. And we should do that for sure. But it's also like, maybe we should figure out ways to tell people what's okay and encourage yeah. them to talk to our kids and things yeah. like that. Yeah, no, I, that, and as you were talking, I was like, man, how can we replicate this? Do you like, have you thought of that? Like, how do you? Well, I put some little teeny LED lights along uh-huh. his wheels. And I've got to tell you, that was one of the biggest hits for getting people to <laughs> smile around Ford instead of look awkward, to not just try to get out of his way, but to be like, oh my gosh, that's so awesome. And it invites mm. people to feel good because his lights are adorable and it gives them something to say that's not just like, oh God, there's a kid in a wheelchair and yeah. what do I do? It's like, that's so awesome. What a great idea. And uh-huh. then Ford's like, they like my lights. And so it creates a moment where people can ask questions and feel like this isn't a sad thing. Yeah. Ford's so awesome in his chair and look at his sweet lights. Yes. Yes. There's really so little thing. Yeah. It, it's working. <laughs> I'm like, wow, I could have put lights on this a long time ago. <laughs> that is such a cool hack. I love that. And I do think like it makes people uncomfortable. Like because oh, we, yeah. even I mean like I I should know, but like I see someone, a disabled person, and I'm like, oh my gosh. 
like, what was it that I'm not supposed to do? And like, oh my gosh, I'm staring too much. Or, oh my gosh, now I'm ignoring them. And I said, hi, but I don't think they heard me. And like, I think a lot of that goes away when you just see that the situation, like our situation with our children is not awful. Like, yes, it's hard, but like he is cute wheelie lights you know like like this is so cute and this is so awesome and we're super happy to have them and I think that helps to spell awkwardness probably because you're not like oh my gosh I'm so sorry it's like wow he's so cute yeah look at how awesome that kid is look at yeah how much fun he's having yeah. and yeah I think little things like those silly lights really just kind of break the ice for people who are normally awkward and uncomfortable because they've never been exposed to it. And mm -hmm. none of us were really raised with how to handle this situation because our parents didn't know either. And they were told yeah. to just be polite and be like, quiet and turn away. Stop, yeah, yeah. Turn away when in mm -hmm. fact, that's what makes us all feel so isolated, right? Is yeah. that people don't want to talk to us and don't say hi and act weird and get out of the way instead of just continue to walk. Like mm. it's a scene. It's a scene. Yeah. yeah. And just remember that we are just like you, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. like I'm just coming here to get some <laughs> spaghetti noodles, like simmer down. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Totally. Like, let's just chat or let's say hi. <laughs> yeah. And there's a really cool thing in my neighborhood and there's chapters all over the country. It's called the Friendship Circle. It's a place where kids, typically developing kids volunteer and they're like buddies, right? Um, maybe they're doing an art class. Maybe they're doing a music class. Maybe they're just hanging out. They can even come to your house. It depends on the situation with you and the kids but they just hang out and they do things, they do activities, they sing songs and they are surrounded by kids like ours. And it's not in a pressure way. There's no adults around like hovering mm -hmm. and telling them anything. They're just hanging out like kids and they're encouraged to just be with one another. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think the lessons that those kids learn, obviously, and that bring into their adult lives is just, it's so enriching, but also what they bring back to when they go to school the next day. Like, hey, mm. I met this super sweet kid named Ford. You should see his lights. I'm totally putting lights on my skateboard. Like yeah. it makes them transfer that energy and that goodness and that knowledge that they're learning to be role models in front of their other friends, right? Who maybe aren't yeah. exposed to it. So finding things like that in the neighborhood That's can awesome. change everything. And I wish there were more things like that where it was just kids being kids mm -hmm. and giving them the opportunity to do that. Yeah. Yeah. And like seeing like, oh, we have a lot more in common than we realize at face value. Totally. Totally. That is really awesome. I'll put a link in the show notes for that if anyone wants to look up the friendship circle. Is that what it's called? Yep, the friendship okay, circle. That's awesome. So as you think about Ford's future, like with friends and just socially, what do you hope for him and what do you wish for him? You know, I I know that no matter what, no matter if Ford has five friends or 15 friends, he feels loved already and Ford doesn't necessarily need friends the way we need friends. And maybe mm -hmm. that will evolve and change as he gets older, but Ford just really likes connection in general. Mm. And he just likes being around people and I'll always give him that, right? Like, and there's so many people who love Ford and will want to be around him. Mm -hmm. um, but friendship wise, yeah, something that would really mean a lot to me is for his cousins that grow up with him, not right now, obviously, but like, mm -hmm. I want, I want them to take Ford under their wing in some way and learn from Ford and teach Ford. I want that mm -hmm. bond for all of my nieces and nephews with Ford to be the same as they have with each other. They're all so close. Yeah. And I really want Ford to feel that. Yeah. I want those other kids to feel that. You know, I don't want everyone to 
whisper or tiptoe around things. Like I want them to know that they're both going to get knocked down and they're both going to get in trouble if they do something (laughs) bad. And, you know, I just want them to learn how to play together in the way that Ford can play with you. Mm -hmm. And I think kids are good at that, right? When we give them the space and we give them the opportunity, kids don't need you to direct them. They just need the opportunity. Yeah. And they're, they're a lot smarter than we give them credit for. (laughs) And like these kids know how to go and talk to Ford and they know Ford can't talk. Like when I see kids from his school doing that, like they can talk to Ford. Yeah. Just like how we can with our kids, right? Like we can talk to her, we can have a whole conversation with them. Mm -hmm. even though they don't talk. Mm -hmm. And I think like there's even, we can even learn from kids because kids aren't thinking, oh my gosh, what if I offend them? Oh my gosh, what if I stare at them too much or too little? Like they're just, they're asking questions like, what's that for? And, you know, like you said, like just talking to them. Mm -hmm. And I think that that innocence and curiosity is a great like role model for us. Yeah. And like l- inviting these kids in to really learn about our kids, right? Like mm-hmm. one of my friends, Tyra had a party and she invited everyone over from the class that her daughter was in. And she made fun activities with the lift that gets her up the stairs and into bed. And with all the mm-hmm. syringes, she showed them, you know, how many <laughs> syringes they use and they all had a water fight and they, you know, she just showed them what it was like in her Mm -hmm. day and it made the kids have fun with it and it Mm -hmm. made them not afraid of it. Mm -hmm. And it, it exposed them to it with the knowledge for sure. But also like, Hey, this is how it is. It's different than you. Just like it's different at your house and your house and your house. Yeah. And yeah, giving the kids the opportunity is all that they need to become these advocates for our kids and these role Mm -hmm. models, because I mean, data has shown like both kids are going to progress at a better rate, emotionally, cognitively, all of the things when they're exposed to each other. Yes. And that like also reminds me of like mainstreaming with school. So like, do you have any foresight in what is going to happen for Ford? Like, will he be put into a classroom with other children that are typically developing? Yeah. So all of his therapists say Ford is going to go to general education kindergarten. Awesome. So that's what's happening. I think for the most part, most schools are doing that now, at least Mm -hmm. for a big part of the day, but I'm not really sure. I mean, Ford's not even (laughs) in kindergarten yet, so I don't even know. I know I'm not in that world yet either. (laughs) And maybe that won't work for Ford. You know, maybe Mm -hmm. he won't be getting the education he deserves if we do it that way. So we're just going to have to see. Yeah. Uh, Cause like IEPs, oh my gosh, you know, like I, that's a whole mm. other thing that we're going to learn <laughs> and oh go gosh, through. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So totally. I kind of, I'm just going to go with the flow and see, mm. see what's working for Ford and for our family. Yeah. That's so smart because it, it really, it comes down to that. Like what will improve and help their quality of life? Like what will make them happier? And, you know, I think it's, it's awesome when it works for kids to be mainstreamed and that works for them, but like it comes down to Ford and his quality of life. I mean, like thinking back, I mean, I'm not that old. I graduated like 10 years ago from high school, which makes me feel really oh my old God, when I so say you're that. like a baby. I'm a baby. I'm a, I'm not that old. You're a baby. baby. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, but even like that recently, we never had kids in our classes with disabilities. Like I remember like there was like the class going to the lunchroom and I was like, oh, there they are. And I almost feel like that amplified my like, I don't know. I don't want to say fear, but like kind of like, oh, 100 percent. Like, I don't know how they work. I don't know what they're doing or thinking or whatever. I don't know. I mean, like, I like the idea of them being in with their peers and like you said, mutually benefiting from each other. Totally. And yes, that is what kept all of us fearful and uncomfortable and uneducated is because we weren't Mm. exposed to it and we didn't seek it out. Yeah. And that's happening now. And all of these kids are so lucky, so much luckier for it. Mm. And so are the adults, right? Who get to see this transformation happening and the teachers who get to go alongside these kids, like Mm. everyone's winning. 
yeah. by, <laughs> by yeah. opening that big scary curtain and being like, guess what? There are all kinds of people. Yes. Yeah. Because it's, it's kind of like the shushing thing. Like when, you know, someone says, what are those in his ears? Or, you know, whatever. And you hear the parent like, shh, stop saying that's so embarrassing. And it's like, is it shameful that he has hearing aids? Like, are they like embarrassed by it? Is it scary? Because it probably is. Like you say, like the way that we, that we were exposed or not exposed to people with disabilities. Totally. I say this all the time. It's even on my shirt. Disability is diversity (laughs) because I think even still in most cases, it's left out of the diversity conversation. People Mm. just automatically think gender, race, sexual orientation, Mm -hmm. religion, and nobody is really putting disability up there in that category when they're going through the list of things they need to include or things they need to consider. Mm -hmm. And it's there. It's a big red fire truck. It's, (laughs) we're the largest minority, not we, I am not a disabled person. Disabled people are the largest minority and Mm -hmm. it needs to be included in these conversations and the shushing needs to stop. Yeah. I'm doing an episode with inclusive children's book authors. And in that, in one of the conversations with one of the authors, um, she was talking about how these books are great for kids to see themselves in, like to be represented, but they need to be with people who don't have a child with disabilities and people who have typical families. They need to be like seeing these children in their books and asking questions because that's a really safe place to explore that and the differences and ask their parents, what is that? And why is it that way for the children, but probably also for the parents, Mm -hmm. like so that people in our generation can like get used to talking about it. Yes. Say it. Yeah. That Gary's gigantic dream book. I put that in Ford's backpack. <clears throat> One of the first days he went to school and his teacher sent it back after a week. And she was like, I sent your book back. And I was like, no, I'd actually like you guys to keep that book in the preschool yeah. uh, because I know you don't have any books like that there. And I'd like there to be a book like that there that you can yeah. read for free time story. And, you know, maybe those are yeah. the kinds of books that we buy our friends when they have babies, you know, yeah. Yeah. maybe we buy them those books. Yeah. And not good night moon. <laughs> yeah. No, I totally, I totally did that this Christmas. We did a book exchange for the the cousins, which obviously translates over to the moms doing it. And I bought a couple uh When Charlie Met Emma mm-hmm. by Amy Webb. Is that her name? We ordered those and I was like, we're totally giving these to to Kimball's cousins. Yes, and it was good job. interesting. Thank you. It was interesting. I was so excited about it. And then we like handed them out. I'm like, oh my gosh, they're gonna think it's lame. Oh my gosh, these other kids got like, like, I don't know, books about space or like just these typical books that kids get. But it was really sweet to see them looking through the pages and flipping through and like, whoa, she doesn't have hands. And um, she has a wheelchair. And from the perspective of a kid that meets Emma with those differences for the first time. And it was really cool. I thought it was interesting that I felt nervous about it. I was like, yeah. what the heck? why am I nervous about this? <laughs> but I want to make it a new thing that I, that I do because you're right. Like these books need to be in their homes. Yes, totally. Especially since none of these parents really know how to talk about it. So they're looking mm-hmm. to us or to, yeah, maybe these little sweet books we can hand off to them to kind of mm-hmm. open that dialogue because just like we didn't, we didn't know. We're learning yeah. too. We're yeah. still learning. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I yeah. love that you were kind of nervous because I totally understand that feeling uh, about giving them the books. And then I'm so glad they <laughs> received it so well. I love yeah. that. <laughs> oh, thanks. I'm not sure about like the, the seven-year-old boy. I still don't really know because I wasn't there with him when he opened it. But, you know, I mean, does like, anybody think... know what a seven-year-old boy wants? <laughs> I, know, I don't know. Like, just, yeah, maybe not. I mean, like, I don't know. It's, I think just giving them, like putting that book in their home and, you know, allowing other siblings maybe just to have that exposure in a safe, a safe place, just at home. Totally. I think is really cool, but yes. Yes. Disabled books for everyone from now on. Yeah. (laughs) Yes. Because that's how it gets out of our bubble. Like we are in this bubble on like Instagram and like with other parents, we're in each other's world. So we get it. But like, it is its own hidden world. Like I just, I didn't think about it before I had Kimball. Like it's so easy for us to be invisible. Yep. Yep. And I would say even a lot of my friends now 
are still not in my bubble, even yeah. though they kind of follow forward and they love me and I love them dearly. Like they're not necessarily trying to learn anything yeah, because it's still uncomfortable for them is the only thing yeah. I can assume. Right. And yeah, I have a lot to do. I can't just make everyone come in and open the door, but it's, it's hard for people. It's hard for people to break those systems yeah. that, that they were raised with no matter what it is. Yeah. Yeah. I relate with that a lot. I think I'm not even sure exactly what it is, but like, I think it goes back to that discomfort of like seeing someone struggle or seeing someone like, I don't know. I remember in the first year with Kimball, which was like living hell and people would be like, Oh, how are you doing? How's Kimball? And I'd be like, not good. And they'd be like, Oh, um, I mean like, Oh, well maybe th- is this going well? Like they were just like searching for like, they wanted me yeah. to say this is going well. And I was like, it's not. And then it's I'd be not. like, Oh, and then I could tell, I was like, they don't want to know. They want me to they say don't it's know. good. And so they I'd be don't like, know. it's good. And it wasn't good, but I could tell, you know, there were a few friends I knew I could be like, it's not good. And I just like start crying. But like, I don't know. I think it's that discomfort we have with hearing people's negative emotions. Like it's, I don't know. That's a whole, that's a whole other can of worms too. Yeah. That's like a that. whole other can of worms. <laughs> it's about, yeah, that, but it's true, you know? And I think that's why so many of us end up feeling so isolated because we get to that point where we're like, nobody really wants to know and nobody can know. Nobody yes. understands and they can't understand because this is so unique and it's so difficult. And also I'm so happy at the same time because I love that my child is alive um, yeah. and I, I'm having fun being a parent, even though this is the worst. And I think <laughs> yeah. that you eventually realize that you have to go find your people and yes. that the before you is great and wonderful and they'll always be a part of you. But there has to be that unveiling and that banging down the door to find the other families and parents who know what your day is like and who don't have yes. to have you explain it or ask any questions at all. Yes. They can just be there. Yes. Oh my gosh. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. And it is interesting. That's another part of this journey that is like just so unique and a gift that we would never have is that connection with other parents who get it. Like, oh my gosh, you're in this secret world that none of my family understands. None of my closest friends understand. And yet you are a stranger I just met and you get it. And now I feel like your best friend. Like we can just (laughs) connect so hard over that. And I just, it's just so beautiful. Totally. Madeline, I flew to Scottsdale last year to meet someone I met online. She flew from Baltimore, Maryland, and we met at a resort in Scottsdale because we had been friends on Facebook after meeting in a feeding tube group. And she was one of my closest confidants. And I had never even really seen a picture of her because she's super private. My family was like, you're getting catfished. Don't go. (laughs) You've never even seen her. (laughs) And the second I saw her, it was even better than I expected it to be. Like these people are here and go find them. If you're feeling alone, Mm. go find them. Yes. Well, that just became one of my bucket list goals is to like meet a virtual friend because there are so many friends, but like they're real friends. Like, man, I got Christmas cards from some of these friends on Instagram. Like we're real friends. <laughs> I just like the idea of like being able to meet one of them in person is just, I mean, like I have friends here too that have been really close, awesome friends that, you know, we meet at parent conferences or whatever, but just the idea of like meeting up with virtual friends is like, we should do sometime because you'll mm-hmm. come to Utah sometime. Totally. Right? And maybe I'm usually meet. there a couple times a year. Well, there we go. That yeah, and you can come to list. Scottsdale with us next time. We like just laid by the pool. We had burgers awesome. delivered to us from Shake Shack. Uh, yeah. that awesome. I don't know. Maybe I'll come visit you in Washington because like I'm dying to go back. <laughs> yeah. Anytime. Too long. Anytime. <laughs> well, vacation and like in the rain. It'll be great. Yeah. Come in the summer. Yeah. Well, you're used to it. So you know what, it, you know oh, what you're yeah. in for. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> Anyways, back on track. <laughs> <laughs> they're not like a side reel. Um, okay. So what has helped you keep some of that closeness with your friends? And like, I know it, we talked about, it can't ever really be a total understanding, but what has helped you bridge that gap a little bit? Uh, starting my podcast, honestly, my friends mm-hmm. get to tune into it on their own time and they get to have a real glimpse into 
what my life is like and who the people are like that are in it. And they get to hear stuff that's not on Instagram or Facebook or when we get to finally meet at a girls weekend, because it's the last thing I want to talk about. I want to have a (laughs) glass of champagne. So, (laughs) and I don't want to necessarily have them call and have to dread that call, right? Like they Mm. don't necessarily want to call me and have that deep conversation every time. Mm -hmm. Uh, So honestly, starting a Facebook group for Ford in the beginning and then uh, transitioning into starting a podcast brought me so close to the friends that kind of pushed themselves away from me and me also pushed myself away from them just in the stress of all of it and Mm -hmm. us not understanding each other fully, loving each other and being really close, but you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um, There was a gap. And I really feel like allowing them to come in and take whatever dose they want out of an episode has really brought them to a deeper place of understanding who I am as a mom and who Ford is. And they've gained so much insight in this world more than Mm -hmm. reading the children's book or, Mm -hmm. you know, (laughs) brushing up (laughs) on some diversity training at work. Um, But hearing, hearing the stuff in people's voices, right? There's nothing like it. This medium is so powerful and you can consume it when you are ready to consume it. And, you know, you can hear the hard things. And, you know, sometimes I just like get something random in the mail, like a water bottle. Cause I was talking about how mine broke on the podcast and like, I'm like, wow, Kelly's listening to my podcast. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, it's a way for people to show up without making it a chore for anyone and without making it obligatory in any way. Yes. That resonates so much with me because even like with family members, I realized like my sister, after I released my first episode and it was about kind of like our overview of like how hard things were in the beginning and stuff. And she was like, why didn't you tell us this stuff? Like we didn't know it was this hard. And I was like, well, like, I don't know. And I started thinking about it. I was like, well, you know, it's just, it's all so much. And it's, when you talk about it with them, it feels more isolating in some ways because you know, they don't get it and they feel uncomfortable and stuff and which I don't blame them. And I do think it's really cool for people, like you said, take whatever dose they want and listen to it in the privacy of their own home and not have to respond because a lot of times it's hard to know what to say. Mm -hmm. It's hard to know how to respond to things, especially when they're hard without saying, Oh, but what is good? You know, (laughs) like trying to like flip it like that. And so it is such a safe place to be able to, you know, share what's happening and what it's like in our lives. Do you have advice for listeners who like are not necessarily going to start a podcast for getting a similar effect? Yeah, I would highly recommend starting a group, starting a private Facebook group that's you updating about your life or your child. So you don't feel like you have to answer the text messages all the time or Mm -hmm. feel bad that you forgot to answer them or didn't have time. And, you know, those things start to cause rips too, because people think you're ignoring them and you're not. (laughs) Um, I'm trying to stay alive. (laughs) But yeah, I, I think starting a group on Facebook and inviting people in and kind of sharing whatever pieces that you feel like you need to share at that time, whether they're happy or not, but letting people in in that way and not putting, not putting an extra job on yourself as a caregiver to do something for another person, because you don't have enough room to do that. And you can't take care of anyone else anymore, no matter (laughs) how much you want to. And no matter how much of a giver you are, like it's not going to happen. And you're only going to wear yourself dry and you have to constantly fill yourself up and nurture yourself because your job is hard taking care of these kids is hard. Going to these appointments is hard. Standing outside the bus and watching other kids walk up and down, laughing with their friends, it's hard. Mm -hmm. And so just let go of feeling like you have to do any of that stuff anymore because you don't. People will help you. People want to help you. They want to show up. They just don't know how. And if you give them a space that is kind of passive and it lets people in when they're ready to be in and gives them insight without being able to ask awkward questions, you'll be surprised 
how many people show up and you'll be surprised about the ones who do some that have never even met you will become probably some of your closest friends. It's, it's something as simple as that long answer. Yeah. Yeah. I really like that. I think that's so cool. Cause it's kind of, it's a version, you know, it's a version of the, of podcasting where totally. you can share as much or as little as you want and people can take however much they want, mm -hmm. however little they want and be able to process it like privately on their own. Yeah. yeah. And you know what? Maybe be a guest on a podcast, maybe tell yeah. your story and share that episode with your friends and your family. Yeah. Sometimes that's the best way to do it. And you don't have to talk about it with other people after it's over. You can just tell your story and you'll be surprised what a weight can be lifted off of you when you do that. Yeah. And you don't know who you're going to touch when you do that. You yeah. don't know how that mom that's at home right now with her kid puking because their feeding tube was on too fast and she's trying to do dishes and everything is hard. She's going to hear something in your story and she's going to feel less alone. Yes. So that might be a way to do it too, but definitely don't hold stuff inside and don't alienate everyone completely. Leave a little yeah. sliver open. <laughs> yes. Yes. And find your people, which kind of goes mm -hmm. back to the, to other parents who get it. Yeah, I For love sure. that so much. I love that so much. Well, thank you so much, Effie. I love how this episode kind of evolved from friendship for our children to friendship in general for us too. Yeah. It's kind of inclusion topic. for the entire family, right? Like yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> everyone, everyone's situation changes and we all have to adapt mm -hmm. and we matter too, you know, like yeah. the whole family unit, they've all, they've all got a lot of work to do. Thank you so much, Effie. I appreciate you. Yes, Madeline, right back at you. Thanks so much. In the show notes, you can find links to follow Effie and her podcast on Instagram, links to check out the books, Gary's Gigantic Dream and When Charlie Met Emma, a link for the LED lights Effie used on Ford's wheelchair, if you're feeling inspired by that as well as a link to check out the organization she talked about called Friendship Circle. Whew, lots of links today. Don't miss next week's episode with renowned public speaker and coach, Dr. Matt Townsend, as we chat about the unique challenges of marriage with special needs children and ways we can remain close through it all. I hope you join us. See you then.